Welcome everyone today to our share our share your journey um, sessions as part of our postdoc and professional um, research staff development. Uh, we are really excited and honored to have Dr. Stephanie Brooks join us today. Steph Dr. Brooks is a clinical professor in the Cl College of Nursing and Health Professions. She's also our senior associate dean for health professions, and she um, is a family, a couples and family therapist primarily, and was the program director of the couples and family therapy program, as well as interim director of the PhD program. Dr. Brooks is an American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy approved supervisor and clinical fellow, and the executive program consultant for the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists Minority Fellowship Program. Dr. Brooks's clinical and scholarly interests include supervision and training, cultural diversity, social justice, person of the therapist training, addiction and behavioral health. And most recently, Dr. Brooks is co-investigator on the first grant, um, which is a transformative faculty development grant uh, awarded to Drexel University to the College of Nursing and Health Professions and School of Public Health. And as part of this, she'll be developing professional development that is inclusive and um, transformative to um, universities seeking to support uh, faculty from historically uh, excluded backgrounds. So we are very happy to have you, Dr. Brooks. Um, most of our attendees are uh, postdocs and um, research staff, some doctoral students. So we really welcome your perspective and we look forward to hearing from you. And for all the attendees, uh, Dr. Brooks welcomes your questions throughout, so we don't have to wait right till the end for Q and A. Right. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, well, thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. It's actually perfect um, from where I want to start. And so I just want to start from the beginning with a, a little bit more of an introduction about who I am and how long I've been here. I. Um, found my way here at Drexel MCP Hahnemann um, in 1995. And so uh, I came in it originally as the associate director for the master's in family therapy program. We had one program at that point in time. And in 2016, I took the on the role of the senior associate dean for health professions and faculty affairs. Uh, I am very, very involved um, nationally and internationally in uh, my professional association, and you'll understand why um, that is as I move along in um, the presentation. And so as um, Dr. Kamal already mentioned that I am a member of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, the executive cult, um, consultant for the Minority Fellowship Program, which is a grant that's funded by SAMHSA uh, to develop a workforce for substance use and um, behavioral health. Uh, so those fellowships admit uh, master students and doctoral students from various programs um, who have demonstrated a commitment to either working with um, individuals and families, persons with substance use and um, behavioral health um, issues and or are interested in pursuing um, um, a faculty position and contributing to the science um, of substance use and behavioral health um, treatment intervention. I'm also um, now, this is my second year, there's a new grant that's funded by SAMHSA that's called the, uh, by it's being housed in APA, but it's a interdisciplinary minority fellowship program that SAMHSA is funding. And it's really, um, it's a really great opportunity for um, the um, counseling, addictions, um, family therapy, psychology, um, and nursing um, disciplines are eligible for that grant. And so we have students at the master's and the doctoral level working together um, in teams to address um, substance use and behavioral health issues. And so you'll see those threads run through my um, career from the beginning to the end, for whether we're talking about working with students or and, and helping to develop pipelines there or faculty in developing pipelines in those areas. So 
I just want to hear some of my goals and things that I um, I'm striving to do throughout this presentation and you're here um, um, threads of it. Uh, I, I really want to uh, punctuate the importance of preparation and professional development and articulating your guiding principles and values. Um, um, I find that that facilitates dis decision making. And constructing a mission statement for yourself as uh, mission statements um, I found and you would hear throughout my presentation are roadmaps for um, my career and developing aspirational visions. Um, and some of that as I've moved along has been pretty grandiose, but, um, but uh, satisfying. And the importance of, of uh, and value of mentorship and sponsorship and both structured and unstructured. And then I want you to reflect on your own journey and what you need and what you think you want. And hopefully we can spend some time um, talking about that as well. So here are some of my guiding values um, that um, are really important to me. The, the, they're personal and professional and, um, and come from my um, um, family of origin um, experience and, and so for me, it's, it's important to honor and value history, both my um, um, familiar history, as well as my um, racial history, my, uh, and, and really think about um, who I am and what I bring to the table and, um, and why I exist. Um, and it's also important because I grew up in a, um, a family uh, system in a community that, um, that I leave no one behind. So when I'm thinking about programs, when I'm thinking about services, I, 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 I'm thinking about how to be as inclusive as possible and how I create pathways where um, there are stepping stones for other people to be able to move forward in their careers and or for me to, dip, to somehow have a positive impact on our treatment, intervention services, or education in this um, um, arena. Um, I want everyone to benefit from what I know and who I know. So I am a connector and I spend a, a, a lot of time with my colleagues in Drexel, but outside of Drexel, plugging people in to um, systems. And that's an important role, as I'll talk more about um, when you consider sponsorship and getting sponsors of really making sure that you um, find people who know other people who can connect you and help you with your next steps. And then my, um, this is very important to me is um, to disrupt and eliminate isms and oppressive structures. And so I'm a family therapist. I'm also a, a social worker, but for years, um, even before I had the language, uh, that has been an important value for me. So here's my professional mission statement now. Um, this has evolved over the years and it ensured diverse clients receive culturally responsive healthcare. And so that goes from the my, my, micro to the macro. And so I'm talking about thinking about how we enter students into college, how we educate them, what we educate them on. Um, and I'm thinking about this, this includes um, services from access to who's providing services and, and what are the policies. It really encompasses for me um, a big systemic uh, view. And so I'm constantly thinking about um, when, when an opportunity comes up for me, you know, how does this fit into what's important to me into my professional mission statement? So when I was organizing um, this uh, presentation, because um, there's just so much I could talk about, I um, decided to use pictures and it really helped me focus on milestones. So, and, and it's been sort of fun. So this is me in 1974 um, when I was in high school. I'm from Newark, New Jersey, which is um, really important. Um, grew up in a fairly, what, what some people might consider a large family. It was a family of five kids. Uh, and 
I'm the second oldest and the oldest girl. And that's really important to the work that I do and just in think naming where I fit and what, what's expected of me. I went to a performing arts high school. I had been a musician for, um, since I was a little kid, played flute and sax, um, vocals. I thought that I would probably go into music and um, a, as a career, had, had many bands um, growing up. And, and in high school, you know, was part of the orchestra and the, and the, um, the, the band there. But I really started to love more than anything else, music history and musicology. And um, one of the things that I, I recognize is that I was very curious about the stories of the composers. Um, oftentimes they were fraught with, it's kind of um, strange when I think about it, but, but it makes sense um, too. But that, those stories were fraught with a lot of pain, a lot of trauma um, that fed their creativity. And, um, and I think that, that I wanted to understand more um, how that worked for, for individuals and how people sort of transcended and was resilient and created in spite of um, these things. I am also a first generation um, college and, um, and um, in my family of, of origin and, um, I, um, the first person who really um, said to me that um, I wasn't supposed to be someplace was my guidance counselor. So I graduated from high school at 16. I was an AB student and um, obviously had skipped a, a, a couple of grades, no problems whatsoever. My high school guidance counselor told me that I should go to vocational school in my junior year which I did not understand and neither did my parents. But my parents didn't um, think anything of it, just told me to go ahead and apply to college. Um, and so I did, um, but not with the help of, of a guidance counsel. Fast forward, and this is really um, interesting, is that one of my sisters who's four and a half years younger than I am attended a science high school in um, Newark. And guess what? The same guidance counsel was there and told her to go to vocational school. She since has become an electrical engineer. So we're, you know, the message that we weren't supposed to be here, if we had listened to these, this, this particular guy, this counselor, I don't know where I would be at today um, and then accomplishing the things. And I wish I, I, I knew where he, was, where he was at many times to be able to present myself to him. So fast forward, um, in 78, I um, move on to William Patterson College which is now William Pass in New Jersey, majored in psychology, took that interest that I had in composers. Uh, and although I grew up in Newark, Newark was diverse. My high school was pretty racially diverse. Um, there wasn't any overt racism that was happening at that time when I was younger. But when I went to Patterson, William Patterson, it was the first time that I confronted a lot of trauma around racism. Um, I lived in the dorms. There were constant um, taunting that was, was happening there. And so um, I had to try to reconcile all of that in the midst of um, being away from home and being basically 16 uh, at the time. I, um, when I was growing up I, during um, church, I met a group of black women throughout who were a part of a public service um, sorority at Delta Sigma Theta. And I pledged that sorority and that really provided a community for me where I was able to be with like-minded women who um, valued their professional success, but also gave back to the community. And, um, and so it was in that sorority that I really honed a lot of my leadership skills earlier on and advocacy skills and got really clear about my purpose. I graduated in 82. Uh, I was in, psych, in psychology. I had applied to psych programs for a PhD. I decided not to go. Uh, I was ambivalent about it. I was 20. So the message was just from my family is like, you will continue in school. So I had to do something. 
But my one of my paternal aunts actually advocated on my behalf and said that I needed to take a break and really decide because that what I wanted to do. And I'm glad that I did that because I I wind up not going into a PhD program and actually working for two years. And um, it was there that I found what I wanted to do it became much more clearer. So I had a job at an agency called the Youth Development Clinic. And I was there as an outreach worker, as a, a person with a bachelor's level. And my role there was to conduct home visits to um, individuals and families who dropped out of therapy and find out why they dropped out and re-engage them back in the therapy. So I traveled all through Newark um, and making home visits, talking with families and really learning a lot. They were really, um, uh, a really was a fertile learning ground because what I, what I learned was that the reasons they, they weren't coming into therapy wasn't because they weren't interested, it's because they have, had other life circumstances that were happening, you know, whether it was a leaky roof or they just didn't have money to get in to see therapy, uh, uh, for to see the therapist or, or what have you. And so that really broadened my perspective of what, what else is needed if you're going to be providing services to clients. It was also there that I had my first mentoring relationship with a woman by the name of Aretha Buck, who introduced me to family therapy. This clinic was um, staffed with um, um, master level social workers who graduated from NYU, and they had studied family therapy um, under um, Salvador Mnuchin and Philadelphia Child Guidance. So they had been traveling from New York to Philly for years learning family therapy. One of the first books that Retha gave me early on was a book of, of Virginia Satir, which, um, who, which conjoint family therapy. And that book um, and those concepts really spoke and shaped um, my decision of what career, my, about my career path. It was the first time that I was able to begin to clearly articulate what it was that I wanted to do at that time. Um, I knew I wanted to. Um, really create a way for um, the black community to have access to quality care. I also wanted to address the, the stigma around mental health that existed in the black community. Um, I didn't know anyone that would go see a counselor, but I knew that people needed to go see counselors. I thought that they would benefit from that. And, um, but there were lots of narratives about what that looked like and what that meant about a person if they sought um, help. So, um, so I was looking for ways to um, change that narrative and, um, and to have people take um, really uh, uh, advantage of services. And so I, I thought that one of the things that I would do was develop this full service comprehensive social service agency, which was my grandiose ideal back then. Um, Thinking that if I um, created, created some community uh, by offering other types of services from um, um, helping services to recreational services that and had counseling service that people would take advantage of that there because there would be a relationship and a connection. And I found that that, has, that is true um, in some of the more successful agencies that I have worked um, in over the years. So here I am. I'm, I'm now in um, Philadelphia with Big Hair. And um, I applied to a number of social work programs, including NYU. I wasn't interested in NYU. Um, I applied to Smith. I applied to University of Chicago, Rutgers in New Jersey, and Penn. And Penn was my reach school at that time. Um, but Penn was really exciting to me because it had out front in um, all of the materials that they had a commitment to social justice, first time I had ever heard that concept in 1984, and that they were developing change agents and, um, and you learn how to work with systems that subjugate persons. And they had five core black family faculty members, which was unheard of for me at the, at the time. Penn also um, had a focus uh, out front on an eradication of isms. 
And so then they were talking about racism, sexism, ageism, um, disabilities, persons with disabilities. And um, that really spoke to me and it spoke to um, the work that I saw myself doing, but didn't have the language for it or a framework at the time. Penn had a sequence in American racism and that sequence um, still exists. So in this PowerPoint and, and you know, and, um, and hopefully I know this PowerPoint will be shared, there are two links in here. One that talks about the um, racism sequence, SP2 article, and then there's a video. Um, um, last year was the 50th year anniversary that Penn has been teaching this American racism sequence. And, and, um, and they've talked about how it really uh, transforms the students, um, white students, as well as um, um, black students and students of color, because it's really challenging, challenges you. And it's the first place when I really look back where I start doing self of the therapist work, because although I was learning a lot about racism, I also had to learn how to um, manage my own emotional self and um, so I could apply it to the work. So at this point, I'm feeling really um, more confident. I have a language, I have um, um, some validation for our, um, some of the experiences I've gone through. I have um, a sense of belonging in a community of people some, uh, and some role models that, that I, also I'm working with. I also have a lot more resources and skills to, to do this work. And um, so during my time at Penn, one of the um, a really important woman, her name is Pamela Thistle, who's a mentor, is a social worker and a family therapist. And she introduced me to research. Um, so the MSW program is really focused on clinical um, or community work and, um, and Pam, was doing a lot of research as well as clinical um, practice. And um, that expanded my, my um, sort of glass, if you will, filled my glass a little more. Um, and Pam really encouraged me to work on a number of projects uh, with her, which I um, did and really enjoyed them. And she was doing all the clinical research at the time. I then also at Penn met, um, these are my two Bobs, um, but Bob Beitler, uh, who is my thesis advisor and was the only faculty member at Penn that was doing anything around mental health whatsoever. And so I, I um, started working um, with him and Bob is responsible for me being in Philadelphia because up until this point, I was going back to Newark. I had a job at the Youth Development Clinic and. And my plan was to go back there, work, and then work to open up an agency. And Bob en encouraged me to interview uh, for two jobs, one at Bryn Mawr Hospital, which I didn't get, and I was relieved and thought I was going to get out of, out of this and not disappoint him. And then a position opened up at HUP, and I interviewed there and got that position, and then decided that I would stay in Philadelphia. So... The position at Hospital University of Pennsylvania was on the inpatient psych unit as a clinical social worker. And I was at HUP for seven years total when, um, um, when I look back over my uh, timeline. I started out working in psychiatry, doing um, inpatient work, working in the consultation and liaison in the emergency room. Um, there and then about three or four years in moved to the outpatient um, clinic, which was a residence um, clinic, um, the third and fourth year psychiatry residents worked there. And I went over as their social worker, sort of managing their intake and, and services um, for, for clients. During early on when I was at Penn, I um, also started my postgraduate program in marriage and family therapy in 87. So I graduated Penn 86, started the program 87 part-time and was working um, at um, HUP throughout. And um, one of the reasons I decided to stay in Philadelphia is because HUP um, 
uh, had a tuition program and they paid for my education to get my postmaster's um, certificate. So the, the, what happened after a while, my next mentor, Bob Greenstein, who was on the other page, uh, was the medical director at the outpatient um, clinic. And Bob, um, as a medical director, enjoyed all the, the, the tasks there, except the administrative tasks. So um, I start picking up some of that work. I, for me, it was self-serving because I wanted to open up a clinic. So now I'm learning how to run a clinic and uh, I'm doing um, things, but I um, um, found myself uh, at, during that time that, cause I was really flying by the seat of my pants, um, really needing to, to learn a lot about running clinics and about policies and procedures and insurance and things of that, of that nature. Bob decided that he would uh, promote me to the clinical director, which was unheard of during that time to have a non-physician in that kind of position. And, um, and I did that for about four years, running the clinic, supervising the residents, um, providing clinical services, I had a small caseload um, there. And, um, and eventually, even as I began to um, grow, begin to, that was actually my first foray into teaching when I was in the, um, the hospital setting. So doing that. And then um, I felt that it was time to leave home. I'd been at Penn for my master's degree. And now, um, so that's two years. And now I'm here for seven years and I wanted to try something different. And so I left in, um, for a position at Council for Relationship as their assistant director of training. And, um, and I was bored to tears. Uh, there was not enough stimuli for me there. Um, it was a much slower pace than the hospital setting. Um, I learned a lot about what, um, what turns me on really in, in a workplace that I like fast pace and, um, and was rescued. I, I feel like I was rescued by um, my mentor, Edward Monte, who was starting a program at Crozier Chester Medical Center there and was looking for a clinical director of training. So Edward um, reached out to me. I was about seven months into this position at um, Council for Relationship. I was torn about leaving as like, who leaves a position after seven months? Uh, I was miserable there. And um, uh, a wise person said to me, you know, you've already demonstrated that you can hold a, a, a position. You were at Penn for seven years. If you're unhappy, leave and do what makes you happy. And so I did. I took a, I took a leap. I, I was concerned about burning bridges, but I um, had conversations with folks and took a leap and went with my other mentor. And it was a great decision um, for me. I um, was at Crozier for um, about two years and um, Marlene Watson had moved to what was then MCP Hahnemann as their um, director. She had been at Council for Relationship. Our paths had crossed there, uh, and, but we didn't work with each other at all. And when I was at Crozier, I began to work with students from her program she knew about my work in the clinic. She knew about my experience in being director of training and assistant director in for a couple and family therapy program. She needed an assistant associate director for her master's program to run the clinical arm and um, reached out to me to see if I was interested. I was already doing some adjunct teaching um, for um, the program. And that started my journey. So um, I, I, I punctuate all of this because I have not really looked for a job. Um, and I've had mentors and sponsors who have connected me to um, individuals or to positions. It was up to me to interview and get the position but it's because of them that I um, 
had opportunities and that um, otherwise I would not have um, been um, privy to. And that that is um, life altering, is, uh, you know, is who you know is really important. And, and um, in the work that we all um, do and, and people need to know you and know what you do. And, um, and what you do and how you do it is, is really important. So here are my final takeaways before we move into our, our discussion um, that I, I wanna um, punctuate here. And that is, um, if you don't have a professional mission statement, get one. I, I, I think they're, they're very important in, in guiding you through the many things that are coming in your di direction. Um, Mentorship, get good mentors. Mentorship supports professional development and, um, and sponsorship creates career pathways. And, and so what I always think that is important for, for, for folks is that no matter how busy we are, to make sure you're, you're taking opportunities to uh, further educate yourself, getting involved with um, initiatives, uh, stretching yourself, and so that you're ready for the opportunities. And I think that for me, that became really clear because I hit my, my wall at 30. Um, by 25, I was finished my master's program. I had the master's. I knew I wanted to get a couple in family therapy education. That was done by 30. Um, so then it was like, now what? Um, and so, the, what's happened after the now what is as the opportunities have presented themselves, um, I have been positioned to take advantage of things that I felt fit into what I think are important, my values and my mission statement. And then, you know, the other thing that I always think about, you know, is it a detour or, um, or is it a de destination that you know, your location is not by accident. It's a, it's a destination and, um, and it's going to launch whatever you do at the next level. You know, I would not have thought that I would have been a part of this first grant three years ago, four years ago. Um, and, but when I look back on my career, and my journey, it fits right in with everything that, um, that I've been involved in and what that's important to me and that drives me. So um, being ready for these opportunities is really key. This is a picture of the family therapy um, uh, faculty years ago. There's only two of us left out of this group. Um, all the faculty have moved on to some other place. Rhonda Whitland, who's in the left-hand corner, is now here as the, um, um, in the assistant director's position of advising. Um, and it was at this, it was during this time that I moved into the department chair's position. So we were kind of celebrating that um, opportunity. And so that's it. I want to stop there. Yep. yep. Thank you so much. That was that was really heartfelt and beautiful. And I, I was just listening to you sharing and there were so many um, nuggets and pearls in there. So I, I, I've i made some notes that I wanna uh, go to, but first let's open it up for our, our emerging scholars. If you have any questions at this time, Dr. Brooks is a mentor to several of us, so. No? No. Nothing? Okay. All right, so I'm going to ask my questions. Um, oh. Yeah. No, go ahead. Okay, so could you share some ways to create that mission statement that you had? Um, how, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, sure. I mean, so for me, it's like, what am I, what's important to me? And, um, and earlier on, I started thinking about, you know, um, how I wanted to make an impact and, um, and how I wanted to create change. And so the mission statement that I showed, of course, is where I'm at now. It's evolved over time. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it comes from thinking about what it is it that you want to do. Um, even before I was 30, I was thinking about how I wanted to be remembered. You know, if people were talking about me, what do I want them to say about me? Right. And so, um, and it also comes from a place of looking from around for me and looking at where's the pain, what, what needs to happen here, and, and, you know, in, in, in the world and what do I have the privilege? I mean, I, I have um, my own um, sort of bouts and been confronted with racism and sexism um, over the years, but I'm also very privileged and so how do I use that privilege to facilitate um, change? So that's, those are some of the, the building blocks um, that I think it's important in developing that mission statement. And I, I kid you not, I mean, I think about when, because other opportunities come and people say, well, you wanna do this? And I'm like, mm, no, that doesn't fit in with what it is that, that's important to me. Um, it's important, but it doesn't fit in to, you know, my basket, <laughs> if you will. So, um, so I, I will stretch even if I'm busy to do something that um, furthers the, my mission statement along. Because that's a contribution that I, um, I, I want to make. Right. So. In and you you touched on this a little bit when you said um, it kind of makes sense looking back and mm -hmm. how it all fits together sometimes where it's not readily obvious. Um, I was also struck by what you said about environments and you said this in passing and you said fast paced environments are energizing to you. Right. Some yeah. people may be overwhelmed by that and stressed yeah. out by that and say, I don't want to do this. I, I can't but you are energized by that. And that's so important to know um, what is exhausting for someone is energizing for someone else. Absolutely. And uh, and I'm, I'm laughing because one of the things that uh, I learned about myself as a clinician and, and I didn't understand it when I'm earlier on is that when I was working with clients, um, persons who were struggling with depression, I was exhausted in the session, could not understand why I was exhausted. And I was like, oh, that makes so much sense to me that I work so much better with patients who act out than patients who act in yeah. because of how I'm built. And um, so learning about myself in that way has been really um, life altering um, and just sort of making those decisions. Um, it's exhausting the, doing the fast pace, but, but it does, it it pushes me to um, make decisions um, and be creative in the, in the moment. And it keeps me on my toes. And I, um, and I like that. How great to know that. And how great. <laughs> so all those problems that people bring to me, I'm like, okay. Oh, good. So I will not hold back now. <laughs> work order and, and everything that I, you know, I'm sort of like, okay, fine. <laughs> okay, great. So Jacelyn has a question. Hi, Dr. Brooks. Thank you so much. Hi. I just want to go back to this idea of the mission statement and um, ask, it reminds me a lot as being an artist first and, and kind of moving into this field second as well. It's this really kind of nice container for the work we do. And it makes sense to me as an artist. And I never thought about it as a researcher or a scholar. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess my question around that is once you develop your mission statement, uh, with whom and to what extent and how readily and how do you share that with people to make connections? Well, I mean, I, I would, um, this is where, and this is something that's been really hard for me because it's, it's, it's counter to how I was raised. Like you don't, you don't boast, you don't, you don't, you don't talk yourself up, Like these kind of presentations are hard for me, um, cause I'm like, what do I say? What, I, what do I don't say? You know, how much do I put here, but they're necessary. And so one of the things that I've, that I've learned over time is that with a person like Dr. Kamal, you, she needs to know 
what, you know, what, what you're interested in. And um, so when you're in contact with mentors or people like myself and so forth, you share those pieces of yourself. Um, I can connect and, and I connect people to other people because I know what they're interested in. And so that's creating career pathways for yourself. And um, you can also actively seek out a sponsor, someone who is in a space, um, a role that whether it's they're a researcher or administrator uh, and um, the relationship with the sponsor is not as intense necessarily as a relationship with a mentor. Sometimes they can be both. And, um, but you want them to, to know about you and your work. So it, you may take them up on, it might be presentation opportunities. They might see you at a, a presentation. Conferences is a great way when we were face-to-face -to, -face to network, it's harder to do virtually. Um, but, um, but you know, going to those presentations, introducing yourself to people. I have people email me cold and uh, I email them back because I know how hard that is. And so I always strive to email back to, to folks and to say, you know, hi, I got your email. When I have a chance, love to talk with you for um, a while. So you have to put yourself out there, but, but starting with the people who are in your circle and, um, and then you know taking some more risks and introducing yourself to people who you think are connected to other people or things that you want to be doing. I used to, I remember I had some students who uh, were years ago and they wanted to work with um, a particular person at um, Penn, but they wanted to get paid by, that person, and I not, and I understood wanting to be paid by by the person, but I was like, so what do you really want? You have to think about what you really want, and whether or not you will, you want to be willing to volunteer to connect and get to know this person. You know what's the long game here, and and so so they got it. They volunteered, and you know years later they were co-publishing a book with this person, and and so forth. But you know really thinking about what you can risk, what you can put, what you can, what you can put out there, how much time you have. Um, but be courageous and uh, practice boasting on yourself. I'm still practicing and I'm 60, so I'm still practicing. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know what this is gonna look like. It's hard as women and it, it's really, really hard. We always, qualify things right like with an extra smile or like oh i'm sorry to take up space but um right. i think when you when you connected it to mission statement if it's part of the impact and legacy you want to leave in the world then it's not so much just about you it's about what you want to do for others and what you want to leave behind so maybe right. that is a little bit um yeah no that's a really good um it's a, a great point and uh you know i whenever i um, my parents are deceased. Like I was like, I could see them cringing now, <laughs> talking about herself. But you know, uh, because that's that's how much it was ingrained. You're modest. You're humble. You're you know, yeah. and uh, so you know, I'm always fighting with those um, parts of myself. Um, and and you do have to bring different parts of yourself to this environment. Uh, and and that is. Um, Something I learned. Something else that I that I, that, I, that as I learned more about this environment, mm -hmm. that I could not only I had to to really actively begin to work on changing myself because um, I couldn't just give folks advice. So, for an example, I'm interviewing faculty members, junior faculty, and. Um, and, and you know, I talk about this all the time. Whether someone takes a job with, um, by the time they get to the department chair, they're talking about salary and what mm -hmm. they want and so forth. And you know, oftentimes I would say, "So, you know, what kind of salary are you looking for?" And and they will lowball themselves, and I'll go, "Time out." Yeah. You know, whether you take this, so I I'll, I tell you, I will deny this, but if you say it in public, but whether you take this job here or someplace else. Uh, you're worth more than that. Uh, so let's talk about how you talk about salary. Mm -hmm. And so what do you want in your startup package? And they'll come in saying, you know, 
well, maybe this and that. I said, no, you want money for travel and you want money for this. You want, do you hear what I'm saying? And I work with uh, the junior faculty that I've hired over years. I've gone back and forth with them um, on their startup package. Now I know that there are other department chairs and other individuals. If you said, this is how much money you want, that's what they're going to give you. If you say that's what you want in your startup package, that's what they're going to give you. But what I've learned is that, I mean, I want you to be successful. So I'm, I'm, I want you to get what you need. I also know what everyone else is getting. Um, and so just learning those kinds of things about the system, um, informs what I need to do with um, faculty or PhD students or, or master's students doing an admissions process. And it also, you know, in order for me to give someone else that advice, I have to take my own advice. So that's the, you know, my own personal work that I have to keep doing instead of sort of checking myself is that, how much are you worth, Stephanie? You know how much you're worth. You need to put that out there. Don't be afraid of um, to put that out there because I'm challenging other people to do that. And um, for you to really look at what it is that, uh, that you were. So there are faculty around here who, who um, there are people who've taken jobs here and they've been really, they've been happy that they did construct their startup packets the way that they did. Because had they done, they've been paying for their own travel, which is ridiculous when you're a junior faculty member and you're trying to, to particularly if you're taking a tenure position and you, there are things that you need to do or you need data sets, ask for the data sets <laughs> and uh, for them to pay for it. Yeah. And not, you know, knowing is power, right? Knowing. Knowing is power. Yeah. No, so yeah. Knowing, yeah. Knowing what people make and what right. is the reasonable expectation makes it easier right. to ask for what you, what you rightfully deserve. Right. Knowing is power. And when I say disruptor, you don't have, I mean, to, that that's disrupting the system. That's a disrupting, um, you know, action. So you don't have to yell and scream and have there's a lot of conflict. But the using your power and your privilege and and um, and being at the table when decisions are made and um, is a way to disrupt the status quo. And so, you know, so I quietly go about doing what I do. Um, and um, and really try not to be reactive because I'm thinking strategically. Where do I want this to go? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 I've learned from mentors. And, and and the thing about my my mentors, only one was a black woman. Mm -hmm. All the men were white men. I never could understand why they were interested in me at all. I, I just I you know used to. Um, um, I was like, why is he doing this? I, you know, I would question it as like, who does this kind of thing? Um, but they clearly saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an opportunity to learn how they operated in some spaces. Some of it I didn't like. Some of it I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and, um, and able to really um, think about how I wanted to modify some of those those. those strategies and um, the way that I worked, how to make them my own uh, mm -hmm. in a way that um, that fits with uh, my personality and my belief system. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? I was thinking since we have, you know, we have, we have about nine minutes, if we could quickly do introductions, it's a small enough group. Yeah. So yeah. Dr. Brooks actually knows all of you. And um, so maybe let's start, you know, Darren. <laughs> so let's start with um, maybe Jacelyn. Um. Sure. I'm um, Jacelyn Biondo. I am a postdoctoral research fellow working under the mentorship of Dr. Yoko Brat on an NIH study for pain management um, and advanced stage cancer using music therapy and also in um, pain management for total knee replacement. And yeah, yep. nice yep. to see you again. Nice to see you. And some of you, I know names and I, you know, maybe a little more of this. So it's nice to connect faces. I don't see anyone anymore. <laughs> I know. Let's, uh, so I'm just going by who's on my screen. So next okay. to you. Hi, I'm Olivia Hernandez and I'm a postdoc in CCI working under Dr. Ellen Bass. Uh, I'm actually on a supplement right now. So we're working on kind of reworking a device that's used for chronic wound care in the clinic to be more uh -huh. 
of a home care in the home setting. Mm -hmm. So are you working with um, Dr. Bass and um, um, Dr. Um, DeMarilla Gilly? Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And Dr. Dr. Sefcik as well. Okay. Justine. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Next on my screen is Victoria. Your story's been inspiring, Dr. Brooks. Thanks for speaking with us today. I'm a new hire here. I'm the happy to be the new project coordinator. Oh, ah, um, yes, yes, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a graduate too of um, Hahnemann um, back in 2000 as an art therapist. And I can't help but comment since I have the mic just for a second. You're in your early years, you sound like you're thinking so much like a music therapist, um, <laughs> being interested in the stories of the composers and the resiliency. Did you know about the profession back then? I'm sorry, I'm just so curious. No, I did I'll not. I did not. Did not at all. Um, you know, it's so, uh, yeah, so it's really interesting because uh, I had, I didn't put it together for, for years. And I was like, oh, you know, that might have been a pathway if I had I known. Um, but yeah, that really, that I was much more interested in that than um, I was like, oh, we have to perform. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Well, it's great to know we have an, an ally, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know that Thank, you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Next on my screen is Nicole. Hi, Dr. Brooks. I am Nicole Varanis. Um, I am a project manager or yeah, project manager under um, Dean Gitlin. So I'm primarily working on the We Care Advisor study um, as well as Good Life. So focusing on um, caregivers of dementia and improving quality mm -hmm. of life for, mm -hmm. for them and the person with dementia. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And next I have Rebecca. Hi, Dr. Brooks and everyone. Um, thank you so much for your story today. That was really quite amazing. Um, I'm a dance movement therapist and I'm also a postdoctoral research fellow under the mentorship of Dr. Kaimal. Mm -hmm. And so I am um, assisting in um, several um, military studies um, funded by the DOD and Creative Forces. Great, good to see you. And Carolina, next. Hi, Dr. Brooks. I think we've been emailing actually about my study. So <laughs> that's, that's one of the faces. Yeah. Um, I'm Carolina. I'm the postdoctoral research fellow at the uh, in Creative Arts Therapy Department under the mentorship of Dr. Yoko Brett. I've been a court study coordinator for her studies. And this past year, I work on my own study um, that I got funding for uh, from the Castle Foundation. It's about mm -hmm. um, a telehealth option, of, uh, telehealth dance movement therapy for individuals with schizophrenia. And I am actually an outgoing uh, postdoc. So since January, I'll be working with Memorial Sloan Pottery and developing, focusing on oh, mostly great. focusing on developing a dance movement therapy research program there. So it's my last month at Drexel. Congratulations. It was very, thank you so much. It was um, wonderful to hear your story. And one thing that um, struck me the most was at some point you said that, you know, you needed to take a break and then something happened. And I think for me, this was very, very inspiring that um, sometimes we maybe need to have like a little moment to reevaluate or get a fresh look on what's out there. I think yeah. that was very important to me. Yeah, I'm so grateful to, for my, to my Aunt Gladys who intervened on my behalf. <laughs> um, and um, because it, completely turn things around. Um, and, you know, as a 20 year old, I mean, you know, you, you, what do you really know? And so um, even you know, that, that was just changing, life-changing for me. All right, thank you. thank you. Next we have Allison, is it Rusko? 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 Yes. Okay. Hi, Dr. Brooks, good to see Hi. you. Good to Hi. see you. Um, so yes, I'm Allison Rusko. I'm faculty in the uh, physician assistant department, but I'm also a second year doctoral student in Dornside School of Public Health. Um, and I am working right now on a project with Dr. Amy Carroll Scott um, in the West Philadelphia Promise Zone. Um, mm -hmm. So we're we're doing some some work with the community engaged research there um, and some CBPR work. Um, and I, I just appreciated your story. I think one of the things that I'm still, you know, learning is is boasting a little more. You know, I've I'm 
not used to doing that. And some of my mentors in the PA department, Dr. Roth, and, you know, would kind of remind me to, to speak up and share my work. So I think your, your story really resonated with me there. Great, great, great. And I saw something in the chat. From yeah, so Laura's um, uh, Wi-Fi is not working properly. So she's sent her introduction via chat. She, Lara is, um, she says, hello, Dr. Brooks, my name is Lara. I'm from Brazil and I'm a postdoc in the nutrition department under Dr. Sukumar. So she's yes. just started last month. We will start a pilot study soon with nutrition and art therapy as an intervention. And this is with Rebecca as well. So Excellent. Excellent. Nice to meet you. This cohort coming in. Okay, great, great. Is this it, the cohort of postdocs? We have people coming in. There's a person who started in November. Darren, we have to connect uh, Chetan with Jonathan Deutsch. She started, and then oh, another yes. person with. Uh, and she, Lara says thank you for your presentation, Doctor. Thank you, Laura. Nice to meet you. And we have one more person starting with Roseanne and Dean Gitlin in January, and okay. one more search is in process for Jennifer uh, Quinlan. Okay, great, great. I think that's it. We have Arun. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you'd like to intro yourself, but hi, Arun. Really up to you. <laughs> Arun and I Arun. ran into the supermarket um, a few, uh, maybe about six months ago. We hadn't seen each other for like a year. <laughs> oh, Arun's saying he can't talk. He's in the Drexel shuttle. <laughs> That's okay. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, any other questions or comments at this time? No. Right, we are right on time, Dr. Great. Brooks. Thank you so much. Thank this you so was much for great. having me. And um, yes. and so, you. as I said, you know, I'm a connector, so feel free to reach out um, at, at any time. Take care. Thank all you right. for thank again. you so much. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. See you thank all you. next week.